Can you see? Yeah. Okay, so if you look at the blue area, this is our limbic area. This is the part of our brain that is the most primitive part of our brain, mm. our whole like evolution. That is the part of our brain that was there way before we evolved to be such smart technical beings, right? So that right there is going to tell us if we're hungry, to eat, we will survive. If we're thirsty, to drink, we will survive. It's going to make things feel good, including like um, procreation, right? Sexual activity. The reason that those things feel good is because our maker wanted us to survive. So that blue part of the brain is going to tell us to do things again that would help either ourselves survive as a person or our species. Do things that feel good. Yes, because that is necessary for our survival. And then when you look at the white front part of your brain right behind your forehead, mm -hmm. that's what I call the CEO of the brain. <laughs> that's your prefrontal cortex. That part of the brain is our stop sign. That's the part of our brain that says, OK, I know that chocolate cake felt good. Mm -hmm. But what I want to tell you is that if you keep eating that, you're not going to feel so good later or you're not going to fit in your favorite outfit. <laughs> um, and that's kind of the part of our our brain that's like, you know, checking our decision making, our long term goals, our impulse control. It's going to say, yes, I know you want to do that, but that's not smart. I want to chime in real quick here mm -hmm. because um, as somebody uh, with ADHD, that has been explained to me as the part of the brain that can serve as like the brake pumping. Yes. Like slow down. Yes. Take a, take a beat. Think about it. Absolutely. And that part of the brain sometimes is under functioning, mm -hmm. um, which can lead to uh, impulsive decisions that you later regret. But anyway, I just want to chime in there because I know right. so many people struggle with that alone. They absolutely can. And so that's one of the things. That, and kids actually do really like to learn about their bodies. Yes. Who doesn't? If we just sit there and say, just say, no, drugs are dangerous. You know, somebody's going to. In the 90s, it was dare. Right. right. It was like you picture this like homeless guy jumping out from behind a dumpster offering you crack definitely say no okay got it <laughs> got it like that's all they taught us I or feel you like. see the eggs in the pan right and you're like i don't want my brain to get fried and it's like do you have any questions yeah i have a lot but i ain't so gonna many <laughs> i'm scared <laughs> yeah. um and so fear fear is not the motivator that i use i use the motivator of let's learn how amazing our bodies and brains are and let's treat them with the respect that they deserve yes um so back to this basically if if something gets into here and it can reprogram and hijack those learned behaviors what's it going to do it's going to raise something on your priority ladder higher up than it should be. Mm. Why? Because our natural joys, like hugging people that we love or like eating our favorite ice cream or like a beautiful day at the beach, they work in a certain, you could almost consider like a Morse code, like it's going to send a certain level of dopamine and reward to our brain and then it's going to subtly kind of go away. Well, the drugs of abuse will send this massive amount of dopamine that no natural source will ever recreate and then it's going to rapidly come off. Mm. And so that really does does mess with the wiring here yep. and it creates new motivations, new behaviors. And this is why you'll hear horrible stories like, you know, a mom who left her baby in the car while she went to use or something. She did not in her right mind most likely have that as her goal whatsoever. But what happens is that the motivation becomes awry. And so she starts to seek that substance without using this part of the brain because over long term this part of the brain beefs up we're not meant to drive in limbic mode all the time we're not meant to be in survival state all the time and that's what addiction does and it slows off these brakes or that stop sign that says let's stop let's check in let's make sure what we're doing is actually making sense when I talk to kids, I make sure that they understand there's a risk to benefit between everything we put in our body. I want to make sure that they understand that the drugs of abuse, there's a select group of chemicals that work on that part of the brain and that therein lies the danger and that addiction can happen to literally anyone. Now, just like any preventable, because it is a preventable disease, just like any preventable disease, there are risk factors that we can take note of to hopefully minimize our risk. And I make sure that kids know, because nobody told me this as a teenager, nobody said, you have an alcoholic parent, you're a considerably higher risk of becoming an alcoholic or having an addiction to something, mm -hmm. whether it be a behavioral addiction or a drug or alcohol addiction. So a family history of addiction is a big one. Using before age 18, for instance, one example, if you start using drugs or alcohol at age 15, you're five times more likely to develop an addiction as an adult. So age of first use is a huge one. Exposure, right? If you're not hanging out around these substances, you're not, you know, one thing I always tell kids is you have a 0% chance of becoming addicted to something that your body never sees. 0% uh -huh. chance. Uh-huh. Let's just sit on that for yeah. a minute. Let's sit on that for a minute. 